Um, if you haven't already guessed, I am Antoinette Gagné, as per my label here. I'm your facilitator today. And thank you everybody for letting us know a little bit about you. And I haven't been able to read out to everybody who has joined us, but it's exciting to see so many of you from uh, different programs and different places. Um, you're helping to provide us with a lot of energy uh, today to get started. So we're going to um, do a few introductions followed by a description of the program and then we're going to take up your questions. So first I'd like to introduce our chair, uh, Dr. Claire Brett, to uh, introduce herself. Hi everybody. Um, so I'm just saying that I'm now no longer doing admit admitting, so somebody needs to take over my group there. Um, welcome and uh, we're really happy that you are able to join us today. Um, we look forward to um, answering your questions. Um, if we, even though this is a very strange time for, we, we have actually been having um, a partially um, online meet and greet um, in the last two, two, I think two years we've done this now, Terry, I forget now, um, to um, so that and we we get a lot of people joining us uh, remotely and it's been quite successful. So it's just that this is just a little more that way. Um, I just wanted to, apart from welcoming you, um, just to assure you that we are um, working diligently on um, on having the most flexible plan in place that we can that takes into account the, most, the latest um, our latest understanding of of the medical. Um, situation to make sure that everybody, including our, all of you, as well as our staff and faculty, are um, are safe, and um, that that will guide how we uh, the planning um, for the uh, or the structure, I should say, of the of the coming academic year. So, um, and we will keep you posted on all of the things that are going on. We're offering currently our our um, summer and intercession courses are all online, and we're planning for the fall in that way too. Um, but we're, we're planning for every eventuality, um, whether, and um, so that we want to be very, very flexible. So I'll say that'll be enough for now. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'm Associate Chair for Student Experience and um, I look at the world uh, through this lens, that is, um, I try to imagine how um, every aspect of our program influences your experience, uh, whether it be the range of courses or the additional services. So I'm here to um, support you along your journey and I look forward to uh, meeting with you over the coming months and coming years while you're in the program. Now we have um, Professor Stephanie Springay, our, uh, go ahead. Hi everyone, welcome. So I am the co-coordinator for the Curriculum and Pedagogy grad program and Safras uh, co-coordinates with me and unfortunately he is giving an international talk at this moment so he could not join us. I'm also the lead faculty for the arts in education emphasis, and I'm also a member of the critical studies in curriculum and pedagogy emphasis and the qualitative research methodologies emphasis. And if you haven't heard about the emphases, you'll be learning a little bit more about them uh, today. But I just wanted to say hello and I welcome everyone to, to OIC in the fall. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, now over to uh, Danny. Hi, I'm uh, Danny Cavanaugh. I'm the program, one of the program assistants in the curriculum and pedagogy program. You can come to me with any of your questions regarding course selection. I can connect you with professors and help you throughout your program. Thank you. And Anne? Please. Hi. Uh, welcome to OISE. Uh, I'm the other program assistant for the curriculum pedagogy program. And I work along uh, um, with Danny to support faculty and students. Thank you. Um, Terry Luisi. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. It's great to have you with us from all parts of the world. It's fantastic. It's a great community of scholars and uh, it's a great community in general. And we're, uh, we're glad to, to, to invite you to join us. Um, I coordinate graduate programs uh, for uh, CTL, 
and I, um, uh, I, I focus on helping uh, registered students, current students, um, with a variety of different questions. Also work on communications and governance um, and course scheduling. Um, so uh, my, my door is always open. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Terry. Um, next, uh, Cheryl. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to OISE. Thanks for coming. Um, I um, work as the Acting Graduate Liaison Officer here in CTL, and I'm involved with um, the administrative aspects of the admissions process for the CNP program, Curriculum and Pedagogy, and uh, for one of the other programs in the department. And I'm also um, the person uh, who is the contact person if you've got questions around uh, scholarships and awards. So again, thank you for coming today, and I'm available. Um, you're welcome to send me an email if you've got uh, questions, um, you know, after this event, and also, you know, once you um, start up your degree at OISE. Thank you, Cheryl. And um, last but not least, um, Kathy, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kathy Bickmore. I'm very happy to be a member of the critical studies in curriculum and pedagogy emphasis in our program and also the director of the comparative international and development education program uh, which is what they call a collaborative program and uh, research center i'm glad you're here thank you very much um we may have uh, another professor who is the lead for the well-being emphasis um, join, us. join us a little later. If he does, I'll make sure to take a brief moment so that he can introduce himself. His name is uh, Jack Miller. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to, um, to Claire, our chair, to allow her to describe the program to you briefly. Okay, and I'm going to just put up a set of slides. Um, and which will, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if that's visible. Everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Always wants to know that. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the kind of key things to, um, to keep in mind. Um, moving forward, which would be nice if my cursor was actually responding. You have to find a little arrow at the bottom on the left hand side as you scroll over the screen. I wish I could see a little arrow. <laughs> Why does this always happen? Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Yes, I think, ah, uh, there they are. Lovely. All right, got the arrows. Thank you. So, um, yes, yeah, so starting with, we have a real, one of the strengths of our program, I think, the critical, I'm sorry, the um, curriculum and pedagogy program is the variety of, of courses we offer. So it's a very rich experience. And there are, um, as you can see from the little, um, the, the bubbles here, the blue bubbles, um, we have a whole range of, of areas, science and education, educational technology, curriculum and theory, Aboriginal education, assessment, mathematics, arts, history, teacher development. And um, there, so there's a real, uh, real choice. And um, it, it makes, I think it makes a very um, interesting and rich program actually for everybody in, um, in this experience. And you can choose courses that, that um, work um, for you and your own interests. Um, in, one of the things that we introduced um, a, a couple of years ago now was to, because of this breadth, so with breadth comes choice, but it also some, can come confusion. So we, we decided that we would um, really focus on what we thought were our sort of core strengths and, and pull together groups of courses that um, fit with some of those strengths. So arts in education, critical uh, studies and curriculum and pedagogy that, um, that we both mentioned earlier, qualitative methodologies, science, math and technology education, digital technology and education. And actually we're just in the process of getting through governance a new, um, um, it'll actually be um, an MED in, um, in online learning, uh, online teaching and learning. And so that will be, it'll be a new field. 
Um, so that, and that will be a fully online program that we'll be adding to our uh, array for next year. Uh, indigenous education and decolonization, science, math, technology, education, and well-being. So there's a real breadth there, and the, those, um, and we, we, in order to, you can have this um, um, noted on your transcript, you have to take three courses within um, any one of these emphases for, um, and the course lists that, that are appropriate for that particular emphasis, that count for that emphasis, is on the, um, on the um, website. You can look at those. Now, our collaborative specializations um, are also very diverse, as you can see from the title. So, um, and Kathy Bigmore, um, who just mentioned mentioned um, before in, in in one of the um, emphases, is also um, uh, the current chair of um, comparative international and development education. And um, do you want to say a couple of words about that, Kathy? I could do. I'll try to let, limit myself to yeah, just a quick, yeah, something like a couple. Uh, it's kind of a funny term, collaborative specialization. What it really means is interdepartmental. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so people have a home program. In your case, I hope curriculum and pedagogy or other programs in CTL, and then they add on the collaborative specialization. So they have an additional intersecting community at Boise. And one of the lovely things about curriculum and pedagogy is that our program is flexible enough so that those can dovetail and you can finish your program at the same time. You're also welcome to be part of any of these research centers and specializations without joining, coming to our seminars and so forth to maybe generate new interests that you didn't have before. Uh, most people have applied to these collaborative specializations at the time of original application, but for most of them, including CITI, it's possible also to apply as what we call transfer in if you didn't know about it before. So feel free to ask me questions and uh, come to our orientation in September and, uh, you know, welcome. Okay, thanks, Kathy. That's great. Um, we. So some of these, um, one of the ones, for instance, the engineering education is an interesting one because that's a, a, a new kind of program. It's just become very popular. And we have a close relationship now with um, engineering, um, with the engineering faculty at U of T. And, the, and, it, and it also connects with our science, uh, math and technology center. Um, so, um, and, and for each one of these um, collaborative specializations, we have uh, quite long-standing relationships with the other um, departments connected with those. Okay, um, so and research centers brings us to research centers. So we have a rich also um, set of research centers and journals actually which have been um, growing. Um, so and there again uh, a, a great sort of variety of these so our French um, center our Franco-Ontarian center our uh, center for educational research on language and literacies education that's affiliated with our language and literacies education program in CTL the one I mentioned before science math and technology education urban schooling and the Institute for Knowledge, Innovation, and Technology. And these are all described fulsomely on our website. So you can, you're welcome to look at those a little further. Uh, curriculum inquiry in the journals is a, is a very, um, very successful, very uh, well-known journal in the area. And um, um, that's been going strong for um, a long time and we hope will continue to do so. Uh, Canadian Journal of Science, Math, and Technology Education is affiliated with the center that um, the that I just mentioned, and um, and it too has been around for for a long time, and um, and is something that you know we many of us um, publish in. Um, there's the Journal of Classroom Research and Literacy, and a new um, MT Research Journal, um, which uh, was launched um, really last year, and uh, so that's that's growing too, and um, and an interesting one that focuses takes very much um, a teaching and classroom kind of perspective on things. And the Journal of Curriculum and Pedagogy. So these two are also described on our, our website. But there's, so there's a, lot, there's a lot going on here. And um, I lost my arrows again, here they are. There we go. 
So some of the nitty gritty here. So in CNP, um, you would take um, for a, a PhD, um, the courses, the seven courses, four courses in CNP, including our foundations of curriculum course, very important one, and at least one CNP approved research methods course. These two are also listed on our website. Two more courses, which are electives and um, the doctoral pro seminar course. And um, the electives you can take in, um, in other parts of um, OISE, in other parts of the department, um, and even uh, across, the, uh, across the road, across Bloor Street in, in the greater U, larger U of T. A part of your requirements, though, for the, um, for the PhD would also to be take a comprehensive exam. And those look different depending on which program you're in, but they're, 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 there's a, a layout for, for this. Um, it's a paper in um, CNP that you write, um, and we have um, um, detailed instructions on how that how that works. And you also could write a thesis um, for that as well. Now, that for the flexible time PhD program, this is this is a sort of alternate option for those who are practicing professionals and. Um, and particularly if that um, your intended field of study, um, we assume is, is going to be connected with the work that you're doing in the world. The flexibility offered is that you can arrange your schedule to accommodate your studies. And, um, but you still need to, you know, think about time that you can spend on your studies and work. I mean, we, we say on campus, but that, and hopefully we will soon be back doing more of that. Um, and there's a sort of residency of four years of full-time registration um, at the beginning of the program. And then you can apply for part-time status after that, which is cheaper, obviously, and allows you to finish up in a, in a way that works for your own life and, and needs. So um, overall, you know, we, we would like our applicants to have obviously sound, you know, academic background and a deep interest in education. Um, and to really know, particularly for the doctoral programs, we, we really want to know that you have an idea of what research is and, and that you, you really want to do that because it's not for everybody. So you, you do want to really think about uh, your goals and to talk, you're welcome to talk with um, any of us and, um, you know, and, and work that through a little bit. But this degree is designed to provide these opportunities for more advanced study for doing original research which is, which is fun, but it needs to be something you want to do, and also theoretical analysis. So our little timeline here um, with, the, with the arrow. So the deadline for submission for applications is November 15th, um, obviously 2020, we've got our, oh yeah, sorry for before, the academic assessment and then our notification of results in the spring. And um, that's our cycle. So, and to get into PhD, an appropriate master's degree with high standing from a recognized university. A minimum of two years professional experience prior to applying. Usually things that are connected with your area of focus and research. And the satisfactory completion of a master's thesis or the equivalent in the form of a scholarly piece of writing. And that can take a lot of different forms, but we do want you to have we do want to see something that's written sort of by you, preferably a solo piece of writing. So we have, because writing is such a big part of doing academic work and that we want to know that you're in a, in a good place to, to do that. And um, here are some examples of the um, kinds of things that you could offer as a scholarly, scholarly piece of writing. Refereed articles, a master's thesis, conference presentation, a book chapter, research paper. Um, and uh, an academically rigorous um, piece uh, should be a theoretical or empirical study and it needs to demonstrate the ability to analyze and synthesize concepts ideas and data and a solid bibliography so those are some of the elements for for the scholarly piece of writing um, and these are the sort of the, the the bits that you need to have in there so you apply online it's all fully online um, post-secondary transcripts, um, they can be submitted online too. Um, and the, um, the hard copy directly to admissions division of our 
registrar's office. In the end, your CV should clearly describe your education and employment history, your research experience, awards, achievements, community activities, special skills. Um, I always encourage people to put in things about writing. If you've done work in curriculum, you know, you can um, add those sorts of things in. The statement of intent is very important because it, it, it's the way that we figure out whether you really want to, you know, how you, um, um, how you fit really with, with us, with the, with the interests of the faculty and the department and so forth. And so, so, you know, discuss your academic interests and your experience and your professional concerns. Identify faculty members that you, you, you know, whose work seems to resonate with, with, with your interests. And remember to talk about how you're a prof practicing professional if you're applying to the flexible time PhD. The academic write writing samples, the other piece, we've just talked about that, and reference letters. We, we really need to have an academic reference and a professional reference. Um, we find that's a kind of good mix. And evidence of English language, language proficiency may be applicable. And there's been a couple of um, changes. The um, Antoinette can speak more to this. Um, Perhaps if, if people have questions, but um, we are also adding the Duolingo, the new Duolingo um, uh, language proficiency test this year because of the complexity of, of um, the current COVID related situation. So we've um, made that a little bit easier to include. Um, the, the base funding package, the graduate base funding package is extended to full-time students in years one to four. And it's approximately, as it says, 24,851, which includes tuition and incidental fees. And there's more, way more information on this on the website as well. And this is for our, um, that, that's for the full-time PhD students, not for the flex time, because the flex time people assume to be in, um, you know, in, in full-time employment. Okay. All right. Um, scholarship and awards deadlines and they're, they're usually um, set a year in advance of the time the funds are awarded. These scholarships are competitive and um, there's on the CTL website is a summary of these deadlines and the different kinds of awards that you can apply for. It's definitely worth looking at those. Um, that's a good thing to um, get on top of even before you come. And here is all our contact information and um, for our program staff. Um, Danny and Anne, who introduced themselves earlier, and also Terry and Cheryl, who did as well. And um, I think almost finally, then we this is the um, Office of the Registrar and Student Services. And um, the important thing at this point is not just to know it's on the eighth floor, because you won't be necessarily going there, but admissions at sorry, admissions.oise at utoronto.ca is the way to get hold of them or the um, phone number. And similarly, this is all um, online as well. So I think that's it. And um, thank you for your attention. And we can um, answer questions. And I will escape from here and stop sharing my screen. OK. Did I manage to do that? No. Nope. All right, Terry, can you, t am I still sharing my screen? I'm now there. Where, yes, you are. Oh dear, because um, I can't see, I can't get back to my Zoom thing, okay. Which won't come up, and it won't show me my thing here. Ah, there we go, got it. Too many things open. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why will it not let me just stop sharing my screen? Are you still sharing or? Well, can you see my screen? All right. No, you're all good, Claire, now. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, while you were talking, uh, we had a whole lot of people um, asking questions and some of the members of our team um, answering those questions. So. Um, one of our very first questions comes from a future doctoral candidate who was asking to uh, describe an average week uh, in the life of a doctoral student. Um, maybe I can just take that one up quickly um, because there are so many more exciting questions. Um, 
if you are um, coming in as a full-time doctoral student, you would be normally taking two to three um, courses um, a week as a full-time student. Um, you would uh, find that uh, in addition to time spent uh, face to face in class that there were quite a number of hours of reading and reflection and follow up work to do each week, keeping you quite busy. Um, if you are uh, fulfilling a TA or um, a GA position, typically you can um, add another 10 hours of work related to, to that and we have an exciting array of additional opportunities in the shape of workshops and mini courses and um, different types of networking um, that you can be involved in every week. So uh, that gives you a little bit of a sense of uh, being a full-time uh, doctoral student. I see that we also have uh, some questions about um, collaborative specializations and whether or not um, it's possible to take more than one. Um, Kathy has taken up uh, some of the answers, but um, Kathy, would you like to just say a few more words about the various questions related to the collaborative specialization? Let me say a word and, and invite my colleagues to maybe also say a word. It, is not impossible to take more than one specialization, but you know, the word specialization sort of implies that you're specializing in that area and it can be quite tempting in such a rich program as, as CNP and OISE to try to do too much. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage you to explore more than one specialization if you would like to. And in exceptional cases, sometimes people really do manage to dovetail more than one. And some of this argument applies to specializations within the program as well as collaborative specializations beyond the program. That is, you, you can't do everything. But this is a really good place for using the advising system. Your advisor's name is on your admission letter. Congratulations. Talk to them. Um. There was a question about when all this happens, and there was an opportunity when you uh, initially applied to indicate your interest in collaborative specializations, but as Stephanie has pointed out, uh, this is something that you can also do uh, once you begin your studies. Um, so it's not like the door has closed. You can look at uh, the addition of a collaborative specialization after uh, your registration in the program. Space available, so it depends a bit on the, on the collaborative, but you should by all means get involved, get on the list search so you know what's going on, and contact the office, which will get you to the director of the specialization you're interested in to, to find out more. I know Saidi at this point does have some space for transfer in. Mm. Um, there is a question about the uh, professional seminar, um, or what we call for short the pro seminar in curriculum and pedagogy, and whether or not it's like a regular course. Um, it is a accredited course, it is a requirement, and uh, the workload would be very similar uh, to what you would expect in any other course. But there is a strong emphasis not only on um, content, but also on process. It really will help you to understand what it means to be a doctoral student and what the journey um, ahead involves. And um, thank you for all those who are uh, providing different answers. Um, I'm trying to focus on those um, that everybody might benefit to hear from. Um, there's uh, Cheryl who's provided um, lots of information about scholarships um, and we will be posting um, a version of uh, this presentation as well as all of your questions and answers so that if you don't have a chance to get exactly the piece of information 
um, that you're looking for, you'll be able to go back um, and consult. Um, so let's see. Um, all right, there's a question about um, the graduate assistant positions. And um, there are questions about how this works in terms of application. Um, perhaps Cheryl, you could just explain a little bit more about uh, how this works for our full-time doctoral students. Sure. So I posted something um, in the chat. Um, I might just uh, repost it. But essentially, if a person is an incoming student and they're a full-time thesis track student, so a full-time PhD or a full-time Master of Arts student, um, they are eligible to work as a graduate assistant, a GA, and that would be part of the um, graduate-based funding package. Um, and so the graduate funding office, a uh, division of the dean's office, um, would have included some um, information as part of your offer of admission letter. Um, and there should be a link to their um, email address in that letter, um, which I'll repost in the chat. Um, and uh, they can let you know when you can start to have access to the online GA system where you would apply for jobs. Um, at the moment, um, faculty members um, are posting jobs on that system. And so students don't have access to it yet. It won't happen until a little bit later um, when they can take a look at the jobs that are available. And then a matching process would occur to match those students up with jobs to which they have applied. Um, so the process for students doesn't start up just yet. Um, it should happen in the near future. But as I say, the um, graduate funding office, um, uh, if it's not in the offer of letter package, then you can check with them to see um, when you should have access to that list. Um, so I'm just going to repost the um, information in the chat space, see if I can get it in there with their um, email uh, address. Thank you so much. Um, we have also a question about um, the advisor and um, I'd like to um, help you know where you can find out who your advisor is and um, if you uh, take a look at your letter um, of offer, you will find at the bottom there is information about who your program advisor is. And just a few minutes ago, Kathy uh, Bickmore suggested that you reach out to that advisor to get help on um, any number of topics. Um, one of them certainly is course selection. And you can uh, reach out via email and request a conversation with your advisor who can give you some tips. Um, you can also ask them um, any other range of questions about the program. But we also have wonderful um, program assistants who can also help you with those matters. Uh, so lots of different people can assist, but each of you will have a named advisor on your letter of offer that you can, somebody you can reach out to. Um, a master's student um, is like any other student, and uh, if you are in the full-time program, um, you can take up to three courses a semester. Um, so full-time students typically are taking two or three courses a semester uh, in the fall and in the winter, and you can take up to two in each of the uh, more intensive um, spring and summer semesters. If you are, uh, there's a question about being a flex time PhD and wondering uh, whether um, the schedule and uh, typical week would be the same. And um, the answer is maybe, but not necessarily. So the beauty of being a flex time um, PhD uh, student is that um, you kind of control how uh, quickly or what pace you'd like to move through the program at. So if you uh, have a demanding 
full-time position and you would like to just take um, one course a semester, that's okay. If you have maybe uh, a little bit of a break in your uh, work schedule, you can decide that you're going to take as many as three courses. Um, it's really up to you. It's, it is different from um, the uh, PhD full-time because they have to be enrolled in at least two courses a semester and complete uh, either a GA or a TA. Um, so, Antoinette, it's yeah. Stephanie Springgase. Uh, there have been a number of questions about the potential of the MED to MA transfer. Um, Why don't you take that question? Are you, okay. Uh, so, for those of you that are currently uh, coming into our MED program, welcome, and we're excited to hopefully meet you in person in the fall. Uh, we do offer the possibility of transferring to an MA. We usually recommend students are about halfway to two thirds through their courses um, because you have to submit a sample of writing, which is usually maybe a term paper, um, and you have to have identified a potential uh, faculty member to supervise your thesis and have identified um, and proposed a research uh, project. Um, so again, it, it's not something that you would be applying for to transfer when you first arrive. So you have lots of time to take courses, get to know the faculty, and then you can speak with Danny Cavanaugh. We have a, a formal process and we have two deadlines, December 1st and May 1st, that you would apply and then a committee uh, reviews your application. Um, there are some questions uh, about uh, moving between a flex time and a full time. Um, Claire, would you like to take that? Yeah, we, um, there is not really any movement between those because the, the full time um, funded is, is funded and so that, that funding is uh, for four years and it's, so it's, it's a pretty tightly um, um, framed uh, set of deadlines whereas the flex time is uh, for people who are working um, and um, in, you know, in, in a professional capacity. So they're, they're kind of different, that so there isn't, um, um, and it, yeah, there isn't a, a you know, a transfer process for that. Um, yes, and uh, somebody was asking here, how many hours of, per week of classes um, would you take? And it depends on how many courses you take in any given semester, and it depends on um, uh, um, your, whether you're part-time or full-time and, and, and your own kind of what's going on in your life. So, but the class is all three hours um, and in, in a normal kind of face-to-face -face setting. Now that we're online, the, um, there are, you know, for the summer, we, the, the, the hours look a little different because you, it depends on, we're not just counting to like synchronous time. And you also have to think about the time you spend reading, um, and preparing for class and the work that you do afterwards and, and all of that kind of thing. So it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's going to vary a lot depending on, on you and the, the program, the courses that you're taking. Um, there's also a question about whether or not uh, it's possible for uh, graduates of our MED program to uh, secure a position in the doctoral program um, later on. Um, I'm wondering who would might like to take up that question, Claire or Stephanie? Oh, yeah, I missed Sorry, Antoinette. I was typing, so I missed. Could you just say it again? I apologize. Oh, um, there was a question from um, one of our uh, from Mira, who was wondering if uh, a graduate of our MED program um, could, in fact, uh, secure a position at a later time in our doctoral program. Sure, I can do that. Um, so uh, we do accept uh, applications from MED students into our PhD program, but as Claire was uh, commenting and on the slide, um, you need to be building your CV, which includes, um, you know, academic conferences, uh, publications and we will it, you require a, an academic rigorous writing sample 
It does not have to be a thesis, but it's something to consider that if you're in an MED program, you have to still be working towards having the materials for the PhD application. Thank you very much. Um, there are some questions about uh, documents and um, original documents and how to get these to um, OISE and so on. Um, can um, maybe Cheryl, uh, can you speak to what happens with this? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just typing something at the moment. Could you, um, sorry, repeat uh, that? Some questions are uh, about um, whether or not uh, transcripts and other original documents uh, should be still mailed to OISE um, or if an electronic version might be accepted at this time. Well, I think actually because the OISE Office of the Registrar and Student Services, um, because people in that office are the ones that actually examine the transcripts and do the assessments, um, I think it's best for them to um, address that, uh, to say what's the best format for them. Um, I suspect that they are looking at electronic transcripts right now um, in cases where people can't get a hold of the hard copy ones. Um, but I don't want to sort of give a blanket statement about it because um, it's their office that does the, um, the assessments. So I'm going to repost the information provided on the website of the uh, OISE Office of the Registrar and Student Services that indicates how people can get in touch with them if they've got specific questions about their application or need to maybe have a Zoom meeting with somebody about it. Um, I was wondering, Claire, if you would take up a question about uh, whether or not classes will be offered oh, yeah. online in right. the fall. Yes. Um, so we are preparing, as I said, for anything. And so um, we will know more um, in a, because we're now in the, doing the intercession term right now and offering online classes and we will do that for the summer. Um, we're preparing for um, a graduated return if, if we are able to, but we're also recognizing that for, there'll be a lot of, we will still have to do um, social distancing um, and that's quite complex in a building like OISE. We've already um, created a plan for um, reducing the number of people in elevators and the, and the waiting. We've staggered all the start times for all of the programs and all of the departments and all of the tenants in the, in the um, building as well, in case we are able to come back and like with no more than three people in the elevator. But um, until we, are, we have better um, and, and more solid um, information about whether we have access to, to testing and um, rules around wearing masks and all of that kind of thing. Um, if, if social distancing is still in play as much as it is at the moment, we'll probably stay online for the beginning of the fall and then hope that we can go back um, to face-to-face uh, -face as soon as, as, as we can. But, you know, but that we will be guided by the medical advice. And there will be people, um, and I'm actually one of them, who, who are immunocompromised and won't, and that could be staff or faculty or students. And um, so f until we have something um, like um, a vaccine, um, th those people are you know, at greater risk and will probably want to continue um, connecting from off campus. So it's, it's a bit of a waiting game, but we are, um, we're ready for anything, actually. So that's our goal. Um, there's a question from somebody asking if they're having difficulty getting in touch with their advisor. Uh, they're wondering what they should do. Um, I wrote an answer to that question. Guess what I said? <laughs> I, I, no, I suggested that they, they get in touch with you or me, Antoinette, if they're really having, having an issue. Yeah. Or, you know, and, and we can, we can, we'll happily give you some advice, um, so. But right. Danny, Kevin is also pretty good at chasing advisors, so he's another one. Ah, okay, so you could have an, okay, so Danny will help you <laughs> chase the advisor. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. And then if that doesn't work, you can come and talk to Antoinette or I. Um, there are questions about the length of the semester. So typically, uh, we have classes for 12 weeks in the fall and 12 weeks in um, the winter semester. But um, 
not everything related uh, to the course may be packed into that time in that professors will often um, allow for another 10 days or so at the end of the semester for final assignments to be handed in. Um, there's a question about tuition fees uh, for the fall. Um, Claire, would you like to take that one up? Um, yes, the, the university is not planning to change the, um, uh, the, the um, fee structure where we are looking for things like flexibility for our doctoral students who are finishing up, who, you know, who've, who've had to delay and who may start a bit later. But we, we're a big kind of, we've done a lot, a lot, a lot of work on um, online learning. And you know, there are a lot of people in this department who've been working in this area for many years. And, um, and I think that we, we um, uh, our courses are really good. And so I don't see this as being a, um, a kind of lesser quality education. Um, we've also put an enormous initiative in place um, where students and former students and um, faculty from CTL have put together um, a, a huge support site for faculty and students um, who are going to be um, online. And we have, um, yes, there it is. And we have um, access to this and you're welcome to go in there and look at all of the resources. We have stuff on wellness, on um, little tutorials, little short tutorials on how to use the different systems that we will be uh, using here. We use um, an in-house uh, LMS called Pepper, which is very simple to use, as well as Quercus, which is built on Canvas, another LMS. And we probably will use Zoom for some of the synchronous elements. So it'll be those tools and support for how to do all of those things, and advice on, on, on preparing for an online course if you haven't had a lot of experience in that is all available on here. And there's also individual one-on-one -on -one support offered for faculty or students who um, are having challenges. And that's that, that site, this site, and the support will continue through the summer and into the fall, and we will keep that going. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of help for, for um, getting into the swing of, of that work. Thank you, Claire. Um, I um, wondered if um, there are any other, I, I see that there are lots of questions that have been answered uh, by members of the team. Um, are there, to, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention in terms of course enrollment, um, uh, once you accept your offer, and I'm certain that all of you will, <laughs> that uh, course enrollment, you'll be able to view course offerings for the fall and winter beginning uh, June 22nd. And I've submitted the, the web location for that. Um, but uh, so course enrollment actually begins July 8th at 6 a.m. in the morning. So the idea is that you uh, visit the website on June 22nd and start constructing uh, your intended schedule for fall and winter, and then um, uh, be ready to uh, start adding the courses through ACORN. And I'll send the uh, link to that as well. That's the, uh, that's the student record system, um, uh, the, uh, the internet uh, interface for our student record system where you can add courses. Um, you'll be uh, wanting to, um, to be ready to add your courses at 6 a.m. on July 8th. So I'm just gonna put that into our chat uh, one more time. Right. Are there any other questions okay. that um, any of you would like to bring up? Yes, Claire? I was just going to suggest that Claire, we, go we ahead. can save the chat and send it. Sorry. Um, can, um, can we save the we chat will. Um, screen here and send it out as a file? We will do uh, that. What we will do is actually uh, taking all these amazing questions and organizing them thematically okay. with all the responses and uh, posting them alongside a, um, a video version of uh, today's meeting. Oh, so, um, it won't be necessary for you to scroll through all of it, but you'll be able to look for the particular items that you're um, interested in. Okay. Um, 
I'm not sure if I've missed any really important questions, but as I said, I see that the team has been very busy uh, trying to respond. Um, so I do hope that we have um, been able to um, answer all of your questions. And before we um, head out, I guess I will just turn to the team and see if uh, there are any final words of advice uh, for our um, group assembled today. No. Nope. Um. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a whole, there was a whole slew of questions that came in suddenly here. Um, fees. Well, I guess one thing that I would um, recommend to people is that if they haven't already done so, uh, the newly admitted students section of the website of the OAZ Office of the Registrar and Student Services is very helpful and it provides lots of information on the steps to making the conversion from a successful applicant to a registered student. So it takes you through the different um, steps that you would need to do um, in terms of uh, confirming your offer, um, taking a look at start times, um, how to uh, begin the process of uh, selecting courses and where to find that information. So uh, I'm going to send a link to that site and um, hopefully that will be helpful for people. Um, yes, there are some other questions um, that we can quickly answer. Somebody was asking about uh, what uh, salary a GA would receive and it's important to know that our graduate assistants and our teaching assistants are unionized at the university and there is a set fee that um, you will learn about uh, that should already be mentioned in your funding package. Um, uh, somebody was asking about taking up a TA uh, at the very beginning of their program, and that is possible. There is a site where TA jobs are advertised, and um, perhaps uh, Cheryl uh, could help uh, by including that in a series of Q&As if, if it's not already done. Um, there are questions, um, sorry, they keep on jumping around as they come in. <laughs> Um, about um, advisors, uh, there, that seems to be a common concern. So just to reinforce, if you're not able to uh, get in touch with your advisor, who should be your number one point person, um, you can always reach out to um, Claire or myself and we can support you in that capacity. Um, Ah, exceptional circumstances. Uh, someone is asking whether um, a change of start date might be possible. Um, and um, it will depend on which program you're registered in. Um, we have a little bit more uh, flexibility to support a change of start date or a full deferral when it comes to the MED program. Um, it's uh, more complex when it comes to our MA and PhD programs. Um, Cheryl, would you like to add anything to that? Um, well, I guess that there is um, a process for making that kind of a request. The um, person would send an email message to the admissions division of the OIZ Office of the Registrar and Student Services. So I'll send a link um, for that email uh, address. And what would happen then is that the request would be reviewed by the uh, CTL and the relevant admissions committee, um, and then the information sent back to the registrar's office. Um, as Antoinette mentioned, in the case of the um, Master of Education degrees, um, the options are that a person can request to delay their start date from September to January, um, depending on the circumstances. And um, in the case of the MED, a person, if they're unable to start in September um, or later on, they could potentially request um, a deferral from September 2020 to September 2021. Um, so that's for Master of Education degrees. Um, as Antoinette mentioned, um, the request sort of depends on the degree. If it's a funded um, thesis track degree, like a full-time PhD or a full-time Master of Arts. At the moment, um, 
deferrals are not permitted for those particular degrees um, or a change in the start date because of um, faculty uh, commitments. Um, um, so right now the change in start date or deferral is really most applicable to the MAD at this time. Um, but if there are extenuating circumstances, um, you could still send in some kind of request and um, uh, the department can take a look um, and, and review it. And um, we have a question um, from Lauren um, asking for clarification about GAs and TAs for flex time uh, PhD students. And uh, I'd just like to say that uh, as a flex time, you can take up a GA one time uh, during your program. And um, I believe that there are not the same restrictions for TA positions. You could be uh, a TA while you're a flex time, a doctoral student. Um, because these are separate unions with separate um, regulations. Um, we have um, someone who has asked about uh, who to reach out to regarding financial aid. And I think we have um, lots of different people in um, our registrar's office and student services who will be able to help you. And uh, we will include all of those specific links for you to be able to reach out. Um, there's a question about um, what the life of the full-time MED is like and whether or not they work. And um, there's a huge variability amongst our uh, MED students, both our full-time and our part-time. Um, the biggest um, difference is whether or not you are an international student or uh, a domestic student. So often uh, our domestic students may already have part-time jobs that they're continuing um, if they're full-time students. Um, of course, a, a full-time international MED uh, could uh, work in certain capacities, but um, often uh, will be quite busy um, in the first year, just acculturating to their new environment and um, meeting all the requirements of the program. But there is uh, flexibility and um, many of our part-time MED students are in fact uh, full-time educators who may be working um, in formal or informal educational contexts with uh, children, teens, or adults. Um, let me know if there are some questions that I may have um, missed. Uh, there's a question about the nature of uh, some of the courses, and I see a, um, that Claire has answered. Um, each one of our professors um, will specify in the course outline that you receive at the very beginning of the course uh, what the assignments and expectations are, and uh, you'll find that there is some variability because our professors tend to be quite creative and each course has its own personality um, in terms of which strand it might be a part of. So you should have a range of different kinds of ways to show uh, your uh, learning or to demonstrate your learning. Um, Rachel is asking about tuition automatically being deducted, and Cheryl has um, perhaps an answer. So tuition being deducted, I'm sorry, from the, I was typing, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the whole question. All-time PhD students are wondering if tuition is automatically deducted from their funding package, or if they have to make a separate payment. Oh, um, no, uh, they don't. What would happen is um, the tuition is part of that funding package, um, but the student does have to request um, what's called a fee deferral. Um, and so that process, they're guided through that process by the graduate funding office. Um, so I can send the um, email address again for that office if, uh, if the student has questions about that. But I believe that that kind of information is part of the funding 
uh, package information in their offer of admission letter. Um, so their offer of admission letter has uh, multiple sheets to it. The first one has the actual offer information and then subsequent pages um, provide some information about the funding aspect of their degree. Um, but I will provide the um, graduate funding office information email address in case there are further questions about that. Um, and one um, thing that came to mind that we haven't really talked about is our amazing work study program. So for uh, those of you who are uh, with us, but not in one of our funded programs, you can apply for a work study position, which um, will give you amazing experience working Somewhere in the University of Toronto, there are hundreds of jobs um, advertised each semester that you can apply for. So if you um, Google Work Study University of Toronto, you'll get a sense of the program. And we can add that into um, our Q&A for you that we will be posting. Okay. Um, I see that we are nearing um, 1045, which is about 15 minutes over our uh, time. So um, I guess, again, I um, want to reassure you that we are here to respond to your questions. Should you have more, we will follow up with this meeting. And um, we're extremely excited about you joining our program and we appreciate that some of you are still up at um, nearly 11 p.m. in your time zone and I see from our earlier um, chat exchanges that some of you are joining from uh, parts of Europe, uh, parts of Asia and also parts of the Americas. We have um, lots of diversity and I'd say that's one of the most exciting um, aspects of our program. It is you as future graduate students who really uh, bring um, a great deal of richness through your diversity. So thank you for attending and um, we will see you um, virtually or in person in the fall. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you very much, bye -bye. everyone. Hey, thanks for coming. Bye.